1930s, uh, 1900s, 1930s to be exactly, 1926. And um, during those years, the island didn't have anyone. Then the first ones that arrived here during the 1900s lived here for sure. So we're going to talk about that once we get up a little bit. But what I wanted you, you to notice is uh, that's, that nature provided them with this place to live. They didn't have to do much. When these people first arrived, of course, they didn't have uh, many things. They didn't have a place where to live. So while they were probably building something else, they, they used this place in order to uh, have their home. It was here in 1807. Uh, then we had uh, the governor of the Galapagos and the prison here during the 1800s also, until the late 1800s. Then uh, the first uh, first uh, people who really settled on this island uh, were uh, Norwegians. Uh, in the 1920s uh, there were several fishing boats on the area, whaling boats on the area. Galapagos was known for being a great whaling place and fishing place also. So this uh, Norwegian fishing boat was in these waters, had a wreck, and then the survivors made it here to Floriana Island. Uh, when they made it here, of course, they thought this was a paradise on earth, and they thought that the best thing they could do is go back home, get some families, get some people, and then come back here and establish on this island, and then set up a fish cannon and whale um, oil uh, plant factory, right? Uh, well, they got back to Norway, they published these uh, ads on first papers and journals and, news and uh, newspapers in Oslo. They convinced several families, they chartered a boat to come here, and they arrived here in 1926. Uh, well, of course, with the permission of the Ecuadorian government to come and establish and set up this factory here. Um, they came, uh, they established very close to Post Office Bay. Uh, Post Office Bay is a very no well-known place that has been used as a mailing place since the 1700s. And that is around the corner by the shore over there. So these Norwegians uh, settled here and um, they... Uh, uh, there was a problem with their uh, their enterprise. They never thought about how far away these islands were from everywhere. So they couldn't commercialize their product. They were producing, but they couldn't commercialize it. Uh, therefore, that enterprise failed. And just after a couple of years, most of them were gone already. They were back to Norway. Some of them stayed here. They acquired some land here. Others moved to Santa Cruz, and uh, they also got some land on the highlands in Santa Cruz. So those were the first ones, the first real settlers here. They lived here for about two or three years, mo uh, most of them, and then they left. Then, uh, in the 1930s, early 1930s, I think it was 1930, in fact, or 31, we got a um, couple from Germany coming here. If you have read the human history about the Galapagos, then you might know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then this is new for all of you. Uh, this couple from Germany were a dentist, Dr. Uh, Ritter, and his mistress, Dora Strauss. Uh, they both had husband and wife back then in Germany. They left them, they got together, and came here. Of course, they had a completely different philosophy of life. They just wanted to live uh, in a place where nobody else could bother them. A natural life, if you want. Uh, they arrived here with almost nothing. Uh, being probably one of the few things that they bought, their dentures. This is very uh, funny. He was a dentist. He said, well, there's not going to be a dentist on these islands. Let's pull out our teeth. And they did, both of them. He did that. He made her do that. And they both came here with this metal dentures to the islands. After a few months, she lost her, so they were both sharing his. So that's part of the story, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's a funny part. I don't know if uh, I should believe that or you should believe that, but that's what the, one of the books uh, says. Anyways, uh, they were here living happily until, um, well, some people also started coming. A year after they arrived, a family also from Germany arrived. This was the Whitmer family. I don't know if you have heard about them. Whitmer family was a husband, uh, a wife. The wife was pregnant, and uh, the husband had a um, child, 13, 14 year old child from a previous marriage, a handicapped child. The first uh, inhabitant of the Galapagos Islands who was born in the Galapagos Islands was their son, Rolf Whitmer, uh, who was born on this place in Floriana. 
The Whitmers uh, established here, they got some land. Uh, nowadays, they have a cruising, uh, cruising uh, fleet. Uh, the tip tops are theirs. Okay, so they established on this place, they stayed here. Um, just uh, another year later, a very eccentric character arrived in the island. Uh, this was a lady from Austria who called herself the Baroness of Galapagos. Starting with the that. Ecuadorian government tried or was trying to have some Ecuadorians living here in order to uh, not have anyone claim the islands or try to lease or buy the islands. There were several attempts during the 18 and 1900s to do either uh, one of those things, buy them, list them, uh, claim them, whatever. Although the islands have been already officially claimed by Ecuador in 1832, but then we had the French uh, government, the uh, uh, English government, uh, American government, all of them trying to get a piece or a chunk of this place. Never happened. Thank goodness. During Second World War, however, uh, the Ecuadorian government allowed the American government to have an army base in Baltra, uh, the place where you mm -hmm. landed. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an army base there. At some point, almost 5,000 people living there. There was also another army base in Isabela, the place where we're going next. Uh, well, I don't know, some of us were going to go to a place in Isabela that used to belong to the Americans during the Second World War also. Right? So this is part, all part of the human history of Galapagos. It's a very interesting history also. So it's not only uh, plants and animals, geology, but also human history that make this place very special. Okay? Marine iguanas and land iguanas from Galapagos, something you should know also. Uh, they are ancestors, uh, they have Those, a common uh, saline like grass that they're seeing right there by the shore. And as you might know, you might not, crabs uh, will uh, pretty much uh, change their shells several times during their lifetimes. Depending on the species they belong to, it could be up to 27 times. Of course, remember this is an exoskeleton. This is made up of chitin, right? They don't have an skeleton like we do, inside but outside. Now, the animal that is inside, the crab that is inside, will keep growing and growing, but the shell doesn't grow. At some point, this shell is going to be too small for the animal living inside. When that happens, then the crab starts fabricating a new shell when it's still inside this old shell. Then if you get to see a crab that is covered with something that looks like a foam, like soap, mm -hmm. uh, stay there and just watch. And then what you're going to see, right here we're missing a piece of... Uh, let's pretend this is it. Uh, let's pretend this is here, okay? Uh, so this piece right here on this portion of the crab is what is called the opercle. The opercle acts like a door. So when the, shell, when the crab is ready to change its shell, this will open up like this, and then the whole body gets extruded from behind, leaving this shell intact, right? What you see here, for example, these are the membranes that belong to the eyes. Okay, it's a bit, uh, somebody's been touching this too much, so uh, over here. And this is the other eye, look, right there, nice. right? So, after it uh, leaves this old shell, it will be a soft shell crab for the next two to three days. And I've heard that people eat that. It's a deli in some areas. I haven't tried it. I don't eat crabs, so I don't know, but I've heard that some people do. So those soft shell crabs will be hiding for the next two or three days because they are very easy to predate. They are very vulnerable at the point. So they will be hiding under rocks or nickel and other chemical elements and as part of its composition. Depending on uh, the color of the lavas, uh, will uh, change according to first the chemical composition of those lavas and second to how old those lavas are. In this case, for example, oops, this uh, lava flow that you see here uh, is not that young, therefore there's been some oxidation, most likely it has some iron and therefore this brownish reddish color it has. If you go to a brand new lava flow, it's going to be quite black. Okay, so this first tells you that it's been here for a while, okay? Second, the kind of lava flow that you see here is something that is called an AA lava flow. There are two types, a hoe hoe and AA, here and in Hawaii. This, uh, uh, friends, uh, let's take uh, 
the age of this uh, island goes from um, that eruption, which happened in 2005, five years, so it's five years old, to half a million years old. It's the second youngest island in the archipelago after Fernandina. Fernandina is the youngest. Okay. Something else you can see here, the two types of lavas that we have in Galapagos. You have uh, two completely different lava flows happening right here. It's very, very clear the difference. Uh, right there, you have something that looks like a highway. That is the Pajoejoe lava flow, the one that I was talking about yesterday when we went for that walk. Very smooth uh, surface, uh, kind of rocky uh, intestinal uh, lava flow. You can go uh, walk on that, one, uh, on that one without a problem. But then everything else is that most of it is uh, what we call an AA lava flow, uh, which has very sharp boulders. It's almost impossible to walk on that, right? Main difference, chemistry, uh, chemically speaking, they are still the same. Main difference is just the amount of gas they have. When a pajoejoe lava flow loses a bit of gas, it becomes something like this. It breaks uh, easily also, okay? Por el seguro, por el seguro. Pues no es como allá más allá, hasta tu padre.